Hello traders, it's Wednesday, April the 12th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade and an for what we can expect in the coming 48 to 72 hours. Well, the name of the game for the past session was clearly a tentative risk aversion, although whether it has gained serious traction or not is up for debate. Uh, the early session, Europe into the early morning hours of New York, saw, uh, saw a very clear and very uh, uh, bombastic, given the surrounding environment, uh, risk aversion sentiment. Uh, that was... Uh, shown very clearly in assets or benchmarks like the S&P 500, which had a nasty spill to start off the day, uh, here actually with the Spider ETF, uh, and putting on alert uh, the sense that something uh, more systemic was happening uh, with a risk-oriented uh, view. Now, of course, one particular benchmark for sentiment, even one as uh, adept at it as the Spider ETF, which I've said in the past I, is one of my favorite because it is a uh, at, uh, from my cold, dead hands kind of sentiment uh, and, and the risk view. Uh, even this uh, particularly intense uh, status doesn't make it a good measure of a individual uh, view on risk aversion. We need to look at other areas of the market. And that was still on display through the session. But as we saw for many of them, we would have the same ultimate outcome with a rebound through the New York session afternoon that put us at about even. Uh, and many, it was actually slightly in the green on the day. For the Spider ETF, you can see that quite clearly here, a large tail at the end of the session. From Global Equities, the FTSE 100 actually was pretty much in the green throughout the entire session. Uh, the DAX, the German ETF, uh, oscillated very aggressively to both sides, uh, putting pressure on that rising wedge, but certainly not something I would consider to be a break, as was the Spider ETF, putting pressure on its trend line support, or at least the most immediate one here, uh, but not providing the break. Looking outside of the equity world, emerging markets, uh, the uh, one of my favorite measures of alternative risk measures, the uh, unusual group that uh, the markets are increasingly migrating to because of the accessibility factor, uh, you can see that it did certainly open the day with a dramatic decline, but clawed back lots of those uh, early losses. Still red on the day, but it could have been a much more productive move if we were looking at true risk aversion. For the high yield fixed income ETF, which is another one of these uh, assets that are growing in popularity, specifically because of the yield and the accessibility. It was a substantial down day, but clearly not breaking the past week's range, so not a, a scalable sentiment view. Now, other areas of the market gave us a little bit more uh, hold. The volatility measures, for example, would certainly hold on to much of their uh, aggressive advance. The VIX volatility index, as you see here, certainly had a very productive uh, jump on the open and subsequent uh, move higher. This is uh, very impressive considering uh, not just where we came from, and yes, the peak uh, that we're currently at is much lower than what we had seen uh, previously six months ago and uh, nine months ago, but Consider the comparable circumstances. We have a rise in volatility here that doesn't really be, seem to be oriented towards any in a specific event, whereas this was the U.S. presidential election. This was the Brexit. And before that, that was just more active markets. The opening months of 2016 and the amazing August 2015 tumble from the markets. In many ways, this is more comparable to that than these. But that does not ensure uh, that you have strong follow through. Looking at a uh, scale of the other volatility metrics here, benchmarking it all to April 1st, 2016, you can see that we have had some pretty uniform increase in volatility, although it's much more exceptional for the likes of equities, treasuries, and gold. Let's take a look at some of those uh, metrics. If we take a look at uh, equities, which we already did, and we can see that this is 
soundly outpacing uh, what we're actually getting in terms of price action. Let's stick with the spider. Overlaying the, actually, let's overlay the spider to the volatility index. All right, the movement in the equity market is not comparable necessarily to the scale of what we see in the volatility. Uh, you can see that the period of drought uh, and the pullback from high uh, for the S&P 500 is coming with a relatively small volatility pickup so far. The drought that we had here, even though we had an intense session back in September 2016, it generated a far more profound volatility response. But the girth, the duration, uh, is something to take into account. Now another uh, gold, since that was second on the list, uh, this GVZ, Gold Volatility Index, is certainly picking up and picked up very aggressively just this past session, and it's not surprising why, taking a look at uh, gold itself, that was an impressive session. That was one of the biggest moves that we've seen in a while, and it was comparable last to the March 15th surge, which was obviously in part response to uh, the Federal Reserve rate decision to hike rates in which the dollar actually dropped, giving good leverage to this alternative to traditional currency, which the dollar is uh, alternative uh, or traditional currency personified. Is this enough to give trend? Uh, well, what's the motivation? I hate to always play the skeptic, but you know, these market conditions have made a great skeptic of me for generating major breakouts to follow through, uh, much less trend. And I have to say that it served me well uh, to be that skeptic rather than being the aggressive person that always swings for the fences. So I, re I retain that skepticism. Is there enough to drive uh, this forward? There could be, but it has to have a motivation. The most productive theme, considering where we started this bull trend and where the most recent uh, motivation came from today, is going to have to come from risk aversion or uh, the dollar's drop, which, given the dollar's uh, disposition relative to monetary policy, it would probably drop with risk aversion too, uh, the, the greenback that is. So if we had risk aversion and the dollar were to decline in particular, then I think that would be a good motivation. But this is definitely a risk-oriented relationship. The same is true of uh, the treasuries. That treasury volatility metric that I showed you uh, is picking up, and so too is treasury prices, which move inversely to treasury yields, which I like to use the TBT, which is a inverse ETF of treasuries, but treasury prices and yields tend to move uh, in direct mirror of each other due to their pricing uh, abilities or pricing uh, particulars. But that would mean that the inverse ETF would also track very closely the yields itself, and it ends up doing that pretty well. You can see that this was a productive move to the downside, treasury yields easing, treasury prices rising, which typically happens in risk aversion. This is a little stickier than what we had seen from equities, uh, though this tends to drift a little bit uh, more and is late to respond. So it may just be late to responding to the bounce that we had in the afternoon session. Now, I know that the FX volatility index that I showed was very restrained, but if we look at the EVZ, the Euro-based volatility index only, that still is exceptionally high. And looking at the risk elements to the EURUSD, I would I would really equate this to the S&P 500. And in fact, when you look at the S&P 500 flipped upside down, uh, the relationship is quite good. And that's because the US dollar is playing more the risk-oriented currency because of its carry trade appeal. And as that more moderate degree of risk aversion kicks in, it undermines the appetite to front-run Fed rate hikes and balance sheet adjustment and thereby the dollar is the riskier currency in this pair. So this is a little bit more reserved, but yet its implied volatility is much higher. I'll be watching risk aversion. If risk aversion kicks in and it's a moderate move, I think that that fits actually quite nicely the ranging that we have from this currency pair. It would play out to this trend channel. A break lower isn't really that difficult to achieve on a uh, contextual basis, fundamentally or technically speaking. 105 is a far more significant level, and obviously 103.50 uh, below that. But generally, it's very difficult to 
keep motivation of any pre-existing trend, unless there is strong wind behind it. And there isn't, especially if risk aversion kicks in and undermines the dollar more than the euro. Now, I'm not expecting uh, risk aversion to just come full scale, but if it does arise, this actually fits the pace a little bit better, in contrast to the yen crosses. The yen crosses are definitely risk-oriented. These are currency pairs that have a very uh, innate sensitivity through carry trade. Uh, given how low the yield is, this is like uh, buying a extremely low dividend uh, stock and paying a lot to get into that stock, even though the dividend is pennies. Obviously, in risk aversion, when you're cutting shares from your portfolio, the, the investment that you got in for pennies... Uh, based dividends are going to be the first to go. And so sits carry trade in this spectrum of risk oriented assets. It is one of the lowest yielding, and yes, this, I mean, we're pretty much at a universal low yield scenario, uh, but it is one of the lowest yielding of this spectrum. So it can be more sensitive to risk aversion, uh, but it also is going to be somewhat restrained. Uh, you can see that the dollar had the dollar yen had a massive move on the day, and it held on to much of that. And it didn't have any liquidity problems through the afternoon session like some of the other asset classes did. So this is remarkable. Uh, though in my Q&A, a number of people asked me, is this time to go short with the break of 110? Well, only if you have conviction risk aversion. And while I do think big picture risk aversion is going to inevitably sweep over the markets it doesn't make it a necessity here and now and this is kind of a, de a decision on a trade that would have to be here and now and that would be a tall order to ensure risk aversion uh, were to occur in the immediate future it's possible but it's improbable if it does have a plan ready if you see a full-scale break let's say a full-scale break of the S&P 500 and obviously tighter correlation risk aversion across multiple asset classes which is indicative of a escalation of risk aversion so greater commitment to it then yes i think that the s p 500 can uh, be a good uh, channel to trade the risk aversion uh, position and if you want a technical barrier the midpoint of the range from the low in august of last year I excluded the Brexit extreme low because there are different lows according to the, the data feed. Uh, but this low, which is more uh, uh, within range, and this high from this, uh, you could say, December or January. That midpoint falls right around 109. That could be another break in the con construct here, and that can be the technical cue that aligns with the fundamental development. And I like to have the two come hand in hand. Not, not necess a necessity to take a trade, but it can only improve the probabilities when the two uh, very unique analysis techniques come to the same conclusion. Now the dollar yen arg uh, arguably is not my favorite yen cross at the moment. Even though risk aversion would hurt the yen crosses and it also hurt the US dollar because of its, its uh, dependency on interest rate expectations, which we've talked about a number of times in the past months. I actually like as well the Euro Yen and the Aussie Yen. The Aussie Yen is a more definitive carry trade uh, and the Aussie dollar doesn't have complications uh, like the Fed does big picture. Or sorry, the dollar does big picture with uh, its monetary policy and extreme risk aversion appeal. Uh, the Aussie Yen is pretty explicit in its risk on risk off appeal. It is at its best, a dividend uh, uh, yielding currency pair. Now, there is a lot of Aussie-based event risk, and this is going to come up Thursday morning, uh, and I will not be in uh, for tomorrow's session, so I won't be recording a video for this, so we should talk about this here and now. Uh, but Thursday morning, we have a collective of event risk that is quite remarkable. Uh, we have the first quarter home affordability index. We have the consumer inflation expectations report. We have the RBA financial stability review and the employment change. This is alone very consistent in generative volatility. So be mindful of this in particular. 
but collectively, this is a lot of event risk that it would it'd be tough not to get at least some volatility. Now, it can generate volatility, but it's very unlikely to generate a consistent follow-through. All right, It's not going to be the source of a 500 pip trend. It can be the source of a 200 pip volatility response if all the data were to be uh, surprising on a bullish or bearish side collectively. So I still like it from the risk perspective, but you got to take into consideration the event risk that we have on docket. Uh, if you are watching that event risk and you don't want the complications of risk on, risk off, well, uh, you can look to a couple other currency pairs. Uh, the Pound Aussie, which I've been watching very closely, and I was I had laid out my preference for this. This was into a wedge. This is an eight-hour chart, and that descending trend line, all right, much more significant technical boundary, and we cleared the upside, which is more difficult. It's more challenging. It requires more conviction. A move to the downside below 165 would have been easier. Uh, it would just been a drift back into range, and it's not. It doesn't take much to motivate. So this is the more difficult outcome. I am not a fan of just going long pound Aussie because of the technical break. It needs greater mo motivation, and a uh, a general drop in all that data, Aussie-based data, can provide. But I wouldn't uh, expect it to provide the trend that I would be much more interested in here. That's probably going to have to come from the pound. And the pound has its own event risk. The upcoming session is going to give us uh, the jobs figures, the CPI figures that cross wires were disappointing, so diminishing the potential for the Bank of England to really motivate rate hikes. So that takes away some of the, the lift. Uh, maybe the employment figures can do more, but it's unlikely to give the kind of consistency that you'd expect in a trend. So kind of a, I think this is a very prominent false breakout candidate, and I am remain very skeptical of it. If you want something that can make the break and actually run with it, my preference, especially for an Aussie bearish outcome, is Aussie Kiwi. This 107.50 uh, approximately, approximate level, or 107.65, is noteworthy support. It's the midpoint of the range that we've had over the past year. It is also the very well-worn uh, resistance that we had uh, between May of 2015 and February of this year. There is considerable technical acuity to it. And add to that a fundamental reason to breach, and even something as restrained as that data collective, uh, where it's uh, incapable of generating lasting trend on the Aussie dollar or Aussie yen, it can put this into momentum and it can f uh, fulfill follow through because it doesn't have all those complicating fundamental factors. So I'm keeping a close eye on this one as well. Other event risk outside of the risk uh, trend itself, and yes, I will be watching very closely, even though I will have no access to my computer, I'm going to be checking charts on my phone on a regular basis. Uh, but we also have the UK figures, as I said. We did take just a look at the pound Aussie. Uh, it's worth also tracing out the euro pound, which is in a broader range. We'll see if we get the bottom of that range. Uh, but breaking to actually clear uh, 84.50 to 87 is going to be difficult to do it. This is There's a lot of fundamental baggage with this trend is about the most difficult thing for this uh, for this currency pair to achieve. I'll be uh, amazed when it actually does. Uh, the pound dollar is similarly landlocked in broader ranges and more proximate technical opportunities seem lackluster to say the least. In fact, when you look at the uh, very active currency pair, and the most active currency pairs, the pound uh, yen, shows that it's not doing the same as the dollar yen, euro yen, Aussie yen, which made dramatic moves to the downside, even crashing through significant support levels. Pound yen is still in this extremely tight range. This really shows the uh, amount of complication that is throwing the brakes on risk trends, which all the other yen crosses are extremely sensitive to. So it might be Brexit and the focus on that for the pound that is motivating. This might be something else, but clearly something about the pound is sapping most of the interest for developing big swings and trends, and it would be remiss if you ignored that fact. Not to say it's going to last forever but it's clearly uh, in control right now. 
Now, the last thing I want to leave off on, uh, because the rest of the event risk is of uh, questionable level in the next 24 hours, uh, the start of the import inflation figures and goes into producer price and then consumer price on Thursday and Friday, respectively. Uh, the U.S. Wall of consumer confidence figures on Thursday, uh, certainly capable of generating change in interest rate expectations, but if risks uh, involved, it's probably going to override uh, the subtle views of monetary policy for the U.S. The Bank of Canada rate decision is almost certainly going to end with a neutral with a slight bias, uh, most likely neutral with a slight bearish bias, dovish bias that they've maintained. Uh, that hasn't been very productive for the dollar cat, although it's quite unique that the Canadian uh, central bank actually leans more dovish, where other central banks are starting to pull up from their dovish bearings. So uh, the fact that they're a neutral uh, gives them a little bit more leeway. Very tight range on dollar CAD, and most of the other uh, CAD based crosses are offering dubious uh, technical patterns. So it's not like we are on pins and needles with trade opportunities from a technical perspective alone. A little bit of interest there from the Kiwi CAD. The Brazil rate decision is probably going to be more remarkable, but uh, not many people will trade the uh, real. Uh, this is pre this is expected to be a 100 basis points or one percentage point change, uh, though uh, the response to changes from the Brazil central bank have been relatively small for the exchange rate. Uh, we also have China trade on Thursday morning, in addition to those Australian figures, and the start of U.S. earnings season, uh, which is noteworthy, although remember Friday is a market holiday for uh, much of the West, so liquidity is going to be an issue to really generate some traction on this, and GAAP standards are always in my uh, doubt list. So limited engagement with the event risk and the liquidity conditions are, are definitely going to be something that adds to the uh, conviction and risk-based trends going forward. So the last thing I want to look at uh, is going to be oil. This has been an impressive swing. If you take away the assumptions that major trend line breaks uh, or major range breaks are going to be the order of the day. Ignore the draw that those that those uh, generate for us. There's always an appeal for a much bigger dramatic move. But if we don't uh, get swayed by the appeal of a major break will follow through or uh, the development of a persistent and aggressive trend, then we are left with looking for consolidation and ranges. And that was a remarkable range. That was a great rebound. And of course, there are plenty of fundamentals to give uh, to give tangibility to it, to explain it. But in reality, market conditions, if these are difficult markets in which to promote clear and, and aggressive trends, then it's simply more likely that you get these kind of circumstances. So when you combine those fundamentals, uh, supply and demand factors at the refinery level, and uh, this past session, Saudi Arabia uh, calling for an extension of supply cuts from OPEC countries, uh, it can provide this lift. The technical trend line that we had there uh, can provide the reversal. So always combining those three factors into a more complete view of what the trade opportunities are. All right, we'll wrap it up there. As I said, I'll be out tomorrow, so no uh, trading and strategy videos, uh, but I will try to record one on Thursday evening, Friday morning. We'll wrap it up here, and until we speak again, I wish you guys good luck trading out there.